Okay, this next portion of the lecture, we're going to be really focusing on image noise and contrast um, to noise ratio. So there are basically two types of noise, uh, periodic noise, which is electronic noise, and random noise, which comes from quantum model, okay? Um, additional gradation processing is what happens um, once the pre-processing has made all of its adjust adjustments, then it's one last refinement of the image. Um, I put perceptual tone scaling on here by CareStream because I wanted you to know to skip that. So don't worry about it. That's very specific to Kodak. Um, it's similar to the old film H and D curve and we aren't going to talk about it. And then formatting the four displays. We'll get get going. So again, here's the two different types of noise. So what causes image noise? So periodic noise is the same as electronic noise. It's inherent in all electronic devices. Um, and what makes it electronic noise um, easy for the computer to um, understand is that small artifacts that are the same size uh, occurring in a regular pattern across the image. They occur at the same frequency and they're found in the same frequency layer. So those are best removed by a frequency processing filter. Uh, and they're actually very easy to, re to remove using a frequency domain processing operation. Random noise is what the name implies. Uh, it's quantum model. Uh, it's caused typically by not enough mass. Um, if the KVP is too low, that can also cause it. It's still small artifacts, but they're of irregular size because it's picking up um, the noise based on the patient size. Uh, it's a chaotic pattern across the image. It occurs at different frequencies, and it's found throughout the frequency layers. So that makes it more difficult to remove using a frequency processing. So that's best removed by a spatial domain processing operation, which remember is pixel location specific. So you need to know the difference between those two. So here's a great image. I had a hard time finding x-ray images, but I had a really good, um, really easy time finding regular images. So you can see on the left, there is no noise reduction. And on this side, there's a lot of um, noise reduction, which actually means that her skin looks smooth. I wish mine looked like that. So that's what noise reduction does. It smooths out the image. So contrast to noise ratio, again, this is also called contrast resolution. It is defined as a difference in signal intensity between two different tissue areas in the image divided by the background. Um, there's a math equation there. Don't worry, there's no math. This is what you need to know about this is this is manufacturer specific. So manufacturers use a contrast to noise ratio software to reduce image noise. Uh, without compromising the image contrast. And so you can see, this isn't even a very good image, but this one has more noise, this one has less noise, but the contrast hasn't been changed. So when we get ready to format for display, I say we, but we aren't doing anything. The computer is doing everything. But what you do need to know is the display system, so the monitor, is the weakest link in the imaging chain, and it has always been the weakest link. So our detectors are the acquisition um, component of the system, and those are very sophisticated. So what you need to know about the um, formatting for display is the number of pixels from the acquired image, which is from the detector, must match the number of pixels in the display monitor. Um, the brightness and contrast must also be the same in both systems. Um, and then the dynamic range must be more sophisticated in the detector image uh, when compared to the display monitor so that you can actually manipulate the windowing and the leveling. Um, and all of this is happening behind the scenes as a pre-processing operation. And then all systems, regardless of whether it's Kodak, Agfa, Fuji, whoever, they all must be standard formatted for digital imaging and communication and medicine, which is DICOM standard. And we're gonna get into that um, in the next section not this after midterm. But I did want to throw this in here so that you can see. So DICOM images are coming from CT, they're coming from MRI, they're going to be coming from fluoroscopy, from regular images, and they're all going to go to PACS. 
Uh, and then that's what allows us to share the images with other across manufacturers and with other institutions. So we'll get into this um, after the midterm. So here we are pre, this is a great slide. This is also the summary, but pre-processing versus post-processing. So the first seven dots on here, field uniformity, noise, histogram analysis, rescaling, gradation processing, detail processing, and preparing for display are all pre-processing uh, functions. So that's all handled by the software. It's not until you get to the operator adjustments that the tech or the red radiologist can manipulate the image. And then at this point, we can apply some special features of edge enhancement and smoothing and that sort of thing. So the first seven steps are what's called default processing that produces the image for the display um, for display on the monitor. Okay, we'll get into post processing a little bit later as well. So post-processing, this is what you're familiar with. So these are adjustments that are made at the console by the technologist or the radiologist. And the first thing you usually do is annotate by adding text to the image, like if you forgot your marker, or if you're adding whether the patient was semi-erect or whatever for a portable. Uh, and then the next thing you usually do is window. So you adjust the brightness and the contrast. So remember, uh, window level brightness, window width contrast. And this is paired with the default gradation processing from the lookup table. So then edge enhancement and smoothing are two other operations that you may or may not do, but the radiologist for sure does. And so remember that edge enhancement and smoothing operations can be a it can actually be accomplished in either the spatial domain or the frequency domain. So kernels, kernel changes are going to happen here, and then this is the high pass and low pass frequency. And then if you're flipping, rotating, zooming in on the image, those are global processing operations and those are again happening in the spatial domain because remember if you're flipping, rotating, or zooming, that's all of the pixels. So that's it's the location of the pixel. So that's very specific. So again, a review of the overall processing operations. Um, spatial domain processing is where the field uniformity uh, Dexel dropout corrections we'll talk about later, detail processing, uh, and noise reduction. Uh, intensity to domain processing is where the histogram analysis, rescaling, and gradation processing and windowing happens. And then the frequency domain processing, again, you can do detail processing, which is edge enhancement and noise reduction. I would highly recommend that you review the 18 point summary at the end of the chapter. It does a fantastic job at summarizing the, the chapter, so I would definitely recommend reading that. And then this is just an image of post-processing so that you can kind of see there's other image processing, stitching, um, you can look at the S values, here's shadow mask processing, image rotation reversal, um, so just things you're familiar with. Uh, and then this is kind of some of the advanced settings that are coming. So dynamic visual, visualization will use facial recognition algorithms um, and that's what Fuji is developing. Um, and then uh, artificial intelligence technology um, identifies bone, soft tissue, and muscle automatically and applies the best processing. And then um, manipulation to reduce patient dose and improve diagnostic clarity. So there's a few other things that are going to be coming down the pipe um, that are advancements in the image processing. Um, I want to finish up with two, um, the last two things, the dual energy subtraction and then grid suppression. So dual energy subtraction is essentially, it's, it's a process that's separating the soft tissue from the bone so that you can see soft tissue of the image or bone of the image only, okay? The advantage is that you can focus on either one soft tissue or bone anatomy and, and pathology, especially if it's hidden behind something. Um, the first approach would be to take two images, one at a low KVP and one at a high KVP uh, in quick succession um, while the patient is holding their breath. Uh, and then the second approach is that there's an actual filter um, that's placed in between the IR plates to kind of capture the low energy photons, which will be the soft tissue image. And then the high energy photons would actually be the ones making it through the filter. And that's going to uh, create the bone image. Uh, what you need to know about dual energy subtraction is on the slides I have. 
So this basically uses that photoelectric absorption characteristic to visualize the dramatic shift between bone and soft tissue. Um, so here is, a, is a, um, a good example of using the low KVP and the high KVP for the same images. So this is the low KVP, this is the high KVP, this is what it would look like if the bone is subtracted um, or the tissue is subtracted. So you can see it's focusing on soft tissue in this image and um, bone in this image. Dual energy is something that you see quite a bit in CT and mammography. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was how does grid suppression uh, work, so grid line suppression. So the grid lines are stationary, uh, usually from, from stationary grids can show up as an artifact, um, but this artifact has a consistent characteristic that's easily identified by the computer so it can be easily removed. Grid lines are unique because they occur in a single axis in the image and they're classified as a low frequency phenomenon because they show up as a large long straight line. So frequency filtering, high pass filtering will filter out the unwanted low frequencies and then the grid lines are removed. So this last image shows you what that would look like. So this would be what the image would look like if the grid suppression software failed. You can see the large um, grid lines in this image and so that's what would happen if it failed. But fortunately we have the, the software to take care of that. And again, that's the end of this portion of the lecture, and let me know if you have any questions.